Hello and welcome. I'm politically motivated and I hope that you are too. If you are, and you're capable of arguing your point without resorting to defamation, I know some of you can't do that, but if you are, then please leave your thoughts in the comments section below. I really would love to hear your thoughts and more importantly, your reasoning for them. In our first video, I highlighted how BBC's Nagamun Chatty's interview technique was pathetic from a journalistic perspective because she had already decided what she thought the correct outcome of that interview was going to be, which was based on the logic that A, the PM was morally wrong to say what he had said, and B, therefore should apologise to the father of the murdered transgender victim, Brianna Gay. And her attempts to trick or coerce MP Chris Philp into agreeing with her narrative continuously required her to interrupt, speak over, and she even misspoke repeatedly. MP Chris Philp, though, is not that crap at debating, certainly not as crap as Naga was, and so at no stage was he tricked off course or off topic. Now, to be 100% clear here on my per personal feelings about Brianna Gay's murder is that it's a completely shocking and a horrific event which I hope will never, ever be seen again on British soil. And my heartfelt condolences go out to friends and family. But I still maintain the fact that transgender men are not women, even if we do call them Miss, Mrs or Mom. Back on topic, though, Tucker Carlson's interview with Putin has to be one of the most surprising, progressive and potentially important interviews of the 21st century. Imagine if Hitler had been interviewed at the beginning uh, by the BBC in World War II. But my main focus, I suppose, about this interview is going to try and answer the following question. Is this the correct way to interview somebody? Now, there are some obvious caveats. I must say straight off the bat, kudos to Tucker Carlson. I don't care who you are or what you believe. A journalist interviewing Putin in the Kremlin is a frightening and potentially life-threatening position to put yourself in. So let's just accept the fact that whatever you believe Tucker Carlson to be as a person, he was probably extremely nervous. But another question, I suppose, is did that stop him from asking the right questions? Was he too scared to ask direct questions? I haven't watched the interview yet, but I hope at some point at least he asks Putin, can Russia be led by anyone other than yourself, Mr. Putin? Would you ever allow that to happen? And if so, how would that happen? Would it have to be authorised by you? Or is it something that could be voted for by the people of Russia? I think that's a really excellent question. And I hope he asks him that, because I'd be very interested to hear what he says. Obviously, we get the Western narrative uh, all of the time. And your thoughts on Russia are entirely your own. Uh, but I am almost certain in most cases that you will have accumulated that um, perspective or that understanding or belief system towards Russia based on Western narrative only. But it's always interesting, I think, to hear both sides of the story. Um, you know, perfect example, a murderer in court gets to have their say. It doesn't necessarily mean that you don't think that they're a murderer and it doesn't necessarily convince you that they're innocent. All it does is it gives them an opportunity to speak their mind and share their thoughts. And in doing so, sometimes they will actually prove themselves to be uh, innocent, but more often than not, um, the chances are that they will incriminate themselves further. So it's so important to hear both sides of the narrative, in my humble opinion, but that's because I'm an old fashioned guy with old fashioned values. And I think Britain um, has been leading the way for many, many years. We may have lost our way in recent years, you know, over the last 100, 200 years, we've definitely led the way in many areas, and law is one of those areas. Okay, let's not progress for too much longer. First thing is, obviously, now I did say about caveats, um, Tucker Carlson here is going to give you a caveat at the very beginning, and um, I won't show you the entire thing. I'll try and chop it down to just the interesting parts, but um, Putin bases his invasion of Ukraine on some very, very long-held, thousand-year-old beliefs and um, rights, if you will, that were accumulated a very, very long time ago. Now, in Britain, it seems to me that everybody is trying very hard to push us away from our history. Um, in Russia, obviously, that's not the case. Um, 
And really, I think holding on to your history is a good thing, but you must have um, the forethought of modern day logic applied uh, at some time. So do I agree with Russia's uh, invasion of Ukraine right now before watching this interview? Absolutely not. Do I think Putin is a level-minded, um, respectable chap who you can believe? <laughs> I can't even say it with a straight face, but no. <laughs> but maybe this interview will change my mind. I very much doubt it. I am very interested to see how Tucker Carlson handles this interview. Tucker Carlson, a bit like Marmite, I suppose. You can love him or hate him. Uh, I'm not entirely convinced which side of the fence he's on, on all subjects, but um, I don't think anyone else would have had the balls or the ability to go to the Kremlin and make this interview. So you have to respect the man for this. He will go down in history for this interview. Let's hope he didn't get too scared and screw it up. The following is an interview with the president of Russia, Vladimir Putin, shot February 6, 2024, at about 7 p.m. in the building behind us, which is, of course, the Kremlin. The interview, as you will see if you watch it, is primarily about the war in progress, the war in Ukraine, how it started, what's happening, and most pressingly, how it might end. One note before you watch. At the beginning of the interview, we asked the most obvious question, which is, why did you do this? Did you feel a threat, an imminent physical threat? And that's your justification. And the answer we got shocked us. Now, um, uh, I have to say that from the Western perspective, that is the narrative we've all been sold, right? Is that um, NATO was encroaching too close to Russia, which is something they promised they wouldn't do. And there is an argument to be had there, certainly. Um, but that is not his reasoning for invading Russia. Now, if, if this interview had not gone out, then you would never have heard the alternative, which you're about to hear. Um, so, I mean, that's an interesting start already. And as Tucker says, you need to listen to him very carefully here. As Tucker says, and I'm talking to those people who, you know, wokeists or whatever, you, you've got to take Putin at his word because I, I have watched a part of this already, just this section, um, and it goes on for quite a while. Uh, he is quoting, as far as I understand, as far as I know, historical facts, facts which I never knew. Facts which may or may not have some relevance or, you know, reasoning for uh, for the invasion. But as we, as we will discuss later on, um, they're not exactly viable arguments in this day and age. But we, we shall move on. We shall see. Putin went on for a very long time, probably half an hour, about the history of Russia going back to the 8th century. And honestly, we thought this was a filibustering technique and found it annoying and interrupted him several times. And he responded he was annoyed uh, by the interruption. But we concluded in the end, for what it's worth, that it was not a filibustering technique. There was no time limit on the interview. We ended it after more than two hours. Instead, what you're about to see seemed to us sincere, whether you agree with it or not. Vladimir Putin believes that Russia has a historic claim to parts of Western Ukraine. Whether you believe it or not, that's the important thing. What you want to gauge from this is Putin's mindset. Now, this is, this is just to refer back to Nagamun Chatty. She would have had a preordained answer. You know, she wants to make him say what she believes to be true. This is the difference in an interview technique, right? I believe that Putin really genuinely believes this. Now, it's, it doesn't matter whether that justifies what he's done. What we want to know is what the hell is he really thinking? And this, I genuinely believe, is what he's really thinking. So our opinion would be to view it in that light as a sincere expression of what he thinks. And with that, here it is. Mr. President, thank you. On February 22nd, 2022, you addressed your country in a nationwide address when the conflict in Ukraine started. And you said that you were acting because you had come to the conclusion that the United States, through NATO, might initiate a, quote, surprise attack on our country. And to American ears, that sounds paranoid. Tell us why you believe the United States might strike Russia out of the blue. How did you conclude that? 
It's not that America, the United States, was going to launch a surprise strike on Russia. I didn't say that. Are we having a talk show or a serious conversation? <laughs> Here's the quote. I'm going to put that weird laugh down to nerves. <laughs> I'm not surprised he laughed at that statement because A, it was quite a funny statement from Putin. And Putin's not someone that I think anyone would really uh, associate with having a sense of humor. Um, but yeah, I think Tucker Carlson, probably a lot of pent up anxiety uh, was released in that little chuckle there. That's just my humble opinion. Let me know your thoughts. Um, but I, I really wish uh, Tucker had quoted where that statement came from. Almost certainly, it's a Western paper or Western um, news outlet of some sort. But Putin denies that, so maybe maybe he's gonna he's gonna say where that quote came from now. Thank you. It's a formidable yeah, series. Because your basic education is in history, as far as I understand. Yes. So if you don't mind, I will take only 30 seconds or one minute to give you a short reference to history for giving you a little historical background. Please. Okay, so that's interesting. Putin has obviously done a bit of homework on Tucker Carlson. I didn't know he had a background in history, um, but clearly he does. But, you know, what history do you know? I mean... If I ask Tucker Carlson, you know, um, could you give me the historical um, information from um, uh, a pool, uh, a town local to me? You know, could you tell me what's happened historically there over the years? He probably wouldn't be able to. So ha having a historical background doesn't necessarily mean you know everything in history. In fact, if anything's proven is that, you know, archaeologists consistently find new information these days that contradicts what everyone has believed for years to be the case, like you know, cavemen were just Neanderthals that had no brain cells and didn't really know anything, but they made tools, they had systems. Um, you know, there's a whole lot of stuff that's being unearthed now that totally contradicts what we have believed for years. So just be open-minded. Um, about historical facts. <coughs> Let's look where our relationship with Ukraine started from. Where did Ukraine come from? The Russian state started gathering itself as a centralized statehood, and it is considered to be the year of the establishment of the Russian state in 862, when the townspeople of Novgorod invited a Varangian prince, Rurik, from Scandinavia to reign. In 1862, Russia celebrated the 1,000th anniversary of its statehood. And in Novgorod, there is a memorial dedicated to the 1,000th anniversary of the country. In 882, Rurik's successor, Prince Oleg, who was actually playing the role of regent at Rurik's young son, because Rurik had died by that time, came to Kiev. He ousted two brothers, who apparently had once been members of Rurik's squad. So Russia began to develop with two centers of power, <coughs> Kiev and Novgorod. The next very significant date in the history of Russia was 988. This was the baptism of Russia, when Prince Vladimir, the great-grandson of Rurik, baptized Russia and adopted Orthodoxy, or Eastern Christianity. From this time, the centralized Russian state began to strengthen. Why? Because of the single territory, integrated economic ties, one and the same language and, after the baptism of Russia, the same faith and rule of the prince. The centralized Russian state began to take shape. So, yeah, we've heard this many times before. It's happened in Britain, happened in America, it's happened all over the world. Once 
the people come together and sort of unify over a, a patch of land, a religious belief, economic um, uh, um, coinage, if you will. Everyone, you know, everyone spends and receives the same coins. You know, that does give you strength and unity. Um, that's that's nothing new. That's not surprising, I guess. Back in the Middle Ages, Prince Yaroslav the Wise introduced the order of succession to a throne. But after he passed away, it became complicated for various reasons. The throne was passed not directly from father to eldest son, but from the prince, who had passed away to his brother, then to his sons in different lines. All this led to the fragmentation and the end of Rus as a single state. There was nothing special about it. The same was happening then in Europe. But the fragmented Russian state became an easy prey to the empire created earlier by Genghis Khan. His successors, namely Batu Khan, came to Rus, plundered and ruined nearly all the cities. The southern part, including Kiev, by the way, and some other cities simply lost independence, while northern cities preserved some of their sovereignty. They had so it's interesting here that he's talking about how um, Rus or Russia became um, weakened um, when power was handed to multiple sons. They became fragmented. That made them more susceptible to attack. And a foreign invader came in and, you know, caused all these problems and took land, etc. Now, obviously, if if you're if you're single minded, if your only belief is that is that Russia is, you know, the most important thing in your life, then that's unacceptable. But it's also very, very similar to what, what he's doing to Ukraine. So I'm interested to see whether he acknowledges that similarity or not. Um, as he progresses, I guess. To pay tribute to the horde, but they managed to preserve some part of their sovereignty. And then a unified Russian state began to take shape with its center in Moscow. The southern part of Russian lands, including Kiev, began to gradually gravitate towards another magnet, the center that was emerging in Europe. This was the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. It was even called the Lithuanian Russian Duchy, because Russians were a significant part of this population. They spoke the old Russian language and were orthodox. But then there was a unification, the union of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania and the Kingdom of Poland. A few years later, another union was signed, but this time already in the religious sphere. Some of the Orthodox priests became subordinate to the Pope. Thus, these lands became part of the Polish-Lithuanian state. During decades, the Poles were engaged in polonization of this part of the population. They introduced their language there, tried to entrench the idea that this population was not exactly Russians, that because they lived on the fringe, they were Ukrainians. So this is our first reference to Ukraine. So Ukraine effectively is um, a term utilized for people who live on the fringe of Russia, uh, apparently. Um, now it's going back nearly a thousand years here. So, I mean, this is, this is old, old, old history. Having spoken to a couple of uh, Lietuva, Lithuanian friends, um, uh, and Polish friends as well, um, they do not seem to be very keen on Russia. Now, bearing in mind, they live right next door, almost, to Russia. Um, you would think that they probably have a much greater understanding, not 
um, they're not going to get a singular narrative like we do over here in the West. They're going to have sort of first-hand knowledge passed down from generation to generation. And I must say that I've, I've yet to meet someone from Lithuania um, or Poland who has a positive thing to say about Russians, but that's not to say they don't exist. It's just that I've never met one. No. Originally, the word Ukrainian meant that the person was living on the outskirts of the state, along the fringes, or was engaged in a border patrol service. It didn't mean any particular ethnic group. So the Poles were trying to, in every possible way, to polonize this part of the Russian lands and actually treated it rather harshly, not to say cruelly. All that led to the fact that this part of the Russian lands began to struggle for their rights. They wrote letters to Warsaw demanding that their rights be observed and people be commissioned here, including to Kiev. I beg your pardon, can you tell us what period, I'm losing track of where in history we are, the, the, the Polish oppression of Ukraine? It was in the 13th century. Now I will tell you what happened later and give the dates so that there is no confusion. And in 1654, even a bit earlier... Right, so that's some 300 years he's jumped there. Um, so they, uh, he, he's saying that Polish oppression of Ukraine, um, they sent letters to Warsaw demanding that they be treated more fairly. Uh, 300 years later, what happened? The people who were in control of the authority over that part of the Russian lands addressed Warsaw, I repeat, demanding that they send them to rulers of Russian origin and Orthodox faith. When Warsaw did not answer them, and in fact rejected their demands, they turned to Moscow, so that Moscow took them away. So that you don't think that I'm inventing things. I'll give you these documents. Well, I, I, it doesn't sound like you're inventing it. I'm not sure why it's relevant to what happened two years ago. But still, these are documents from the archives, copies. Here are the letters from Bogdan Khmelnytsky, the man who then controlled the power in this part of the Russian lands that is now called Ukraine. He wrote to Warsaw demanding that their rights be upheld. And after being refused, he began to write letters to Moscow, asking to take them under the strong hand of the Moscow Tsar. There are copies of these documents. I will leave them for your good memory. There's okay, so let's give him a bit of kudos there. You know, A, you know, he's remembering all this without a script. So unlike some um, uh, leaders of countries uh, who can't seem to remember their own name, uh, he has a very very good grasp on um, on what he's thinking, which is excellent. Um, I, when I say excellent, I mean impressive. I mean, he is reeling off a thousand years worth of history with accurate dates and backing it up with documentation. That is quite impressive, okay? Doesn't matter whether or not, whether or not what he did was right or wrong, that is a stands alone. Um, you know, this guy is definitely more switched on than some political leaders. Um, but yes, it's interesting. So his argument seems to be stemming from the fact that uh, in the 16th century, 17th century, I think it is, uh, I've lost track now, um, Ukraine asked to be taken under the wing of Moscow, aka be enveloped as part of Russia. So they asked to become, okay, so that's probably his argument is stemming from, unless he veers off somewhere in his... As a translation into uh, Russian, uh, you can translate it into English later. Russia would not agree to admit them straight away, assuming that the war with Poland would start. Nevertheless, in 1654, the pan-Russian assembly of top clergy and landowners headed by the Tsar 
which was the representative body of the power of the old Russian state, decided to include a part of the old Russian lands into Moscow Kingdom. As expected, the war with Poland began. It lasted 13 years and then in 1654 a truce was concluded. And 32 years later, I think, a peace treaty with Poland, which they called Eternal Peace, was signed. And these lands, the whole left bank of Dnieper, including Kiev, went to Russia. And the whole right bank of Dnieper remained in Poland. Under the rule of Katharina the Great, Russia reclaimed all of its historical lands, including in the south and west. This all lasted until the revolution. Before World War I, Austrian general staff relied on the ideas of Ukrainianization and started actively promoting the ideas of Ukraine and the Ukrainianization. Their motive was obvious. Just before World War I, they wanted to weaken the potential enemy and secure themselves favorable conditions in the border area. So the idea which had emerged in Poland that people residing in that territory were allegedly not really Russians, but rather belonged to a special ethnic group, Ukrainians, started being propagated by the Austrian general staff. As far back as the 19th century, theorists calling for Ukrainian independence appeared. All those, however, claim that Ukraine should have a very good relationship with Russia. They insisted on that. After the 1917 revolution, the Bolsheviks sought to restore the statehood and the civil war began, including the hostilities with Poland. In 1921, peace with Poland was proclaimed, and under that treaty, the right bank of Dnieper River once again was given back to Poland. In 1939, after Poland cooperated with Hitler, he did collaborate with Hitler, you know, Hitler offered Poland peace and a treaty of friendship an alliance demanding in return that Poland give back to Germany the so-called Danzig Corridor, which connected the bulk of Germany with East Prussia and Königsberg. After World War I, this territory was transferred to Poland, and instead of Danzig, a city of Dansk emerged. Hitler asked them to give it amicably, but they refused. Of course. Still, they collaborated with Hitler and engaged together in the partitioning of Czechoslovakia. But may I ask you, you're making the case that, that Ukraine, certainly parts of Ukraine, Eastern Ukraine is in, in effect Russia has been for hundreds of years. Why wouldn't you just take it when you became president? 24 years ago. You have nuclear weapons, they don't. If it's actually your land, why did you wait so long? Sure. Okay, so some interesting historical facts there, um, which obviously I would have to double double check to be 100% sure. But um, some accusations about Poland being in collaboration with, uh, with uh, the Nazis and yet refusing to give them the corridor, kind of yeah, controversial, you know. Um, a conflicting sort of story there, if you will. But Tucker Carlson, I think, has been very patient. Now, compare this to the interview with Naga, where she was constantly bashing him over the head and interrupting him. And now, okay, this is a very different situation. But at least he's allowing the man to speak. And he's interjecting on the subject which they are talking about, not bringing him back to the beginning of the conversation, and demanding that um, he answer just the narrative of the question the way that she wanted it. This is a very different interviewing technique, and I am I am learning far more about um, Putin in this interview already than I I did in watching the other interview, which in my mind just went round in circles for ages. 
and then ended up exactly where it started. It was a totally pointless interview. And her interviewing technique is, I think, absolutely abhorrent. Um, and she should be stopped from doing that. In fact, all interviewers on the BBC should be stopped from doing that. But um, anyway, sorry, I digress. I'll good. tell you. Uh, I'm coming to that. This briefing is coming to an end. It might be boring, but it explains many things. I just don't know how it's relevant. Good. Good. I'm so gratified that you appreciate that. Thank you. So, before World War II, Poland collaborated with Hitler, and although it did not yield to Hitler's demands, it still participated in the partitioning of Czechoslovakia together with Hitler, as the Poles had not given the Danzig corridor to Germany and went too far, pushing Hitler to start World War II by attacking them. Why was it Poland against whom the war started on 1st September 1939? Poland turned out to be uncompromising and Hitler had nothing to do but start implementing his plans with Poland. By the way, the USSR, I have read some archive documents, behaved very honestly. It asked Poland's permission to transit its troops through the Polish territory to help Czechoslovakia. But the then Polish foreign minister said that if the Soviet plans flew over Poland, they would be downed over the territory of Poland. <coughs> but that doesn't matter. What matters is that the war began, and Poland fell prey to the policies it had pursued against Czechoslovakia. It's it kind of um, nullifies his statement that Poland were in collaboration with, with the Nazis, does it not? That they refused basically everything the Nazis demanded of them, they refused to do, and then the Nazis invaded them. I mean, that doesn't sound like collaboration in my book, but uh, yeah, correct me if you think I'm wrong. Under the well known Molotov Ribbentrop Pact, part of the territory, including Western Ukraine, was to be given to Russia. Thus, Russia, which was then named the USSR, regained its historical lands. After the victory in the Great Patriotic War, as we call World War II, all those territories were ultimately enshrined as belonging to Russia, to the USSR. As for Poland, it received, apparently in compensation, the lands which had originally been German. The eastern parts of Germany, these are now western lands of Poland. Of course, Poland regained access to the Baltic Sea and Danzig, which was once again given its Polish name. So, this was how this situation developed. In 1922, when the USSR was being established, the Bolsheviks started building the USSR and established the Soviet Ukraine, which had never existed before. Right. Stalin insisted that those republics be included in the USSR as autonomous entities. For some inexplicable reason, Lenin, the founder of the Soviet state, insisted that they be entitled to withdraw from the USSR. <clears throat> and again, for some unknown reasons, he transferred to that newly established Soviet Republic of Ukraine some of the lands together with people living there, even though those lands had never been called Ukraine. And yet, they were made part of that Soviet Republic of Ukraine. Those lands included the Black Sea region, which was received under Catherine the Great, and which had no historical connection with Ukraine whatsoever. Even if we go as far back as 1654, when these lands returned to Russian Empire, that territory was the size of three to four regions of modern Ukraine, with no Black Sea region. That was completely out of the question. In 1654? Exactly. Well, I'm just, I, you obviously have encyclopedic knowledge of this region, but why didn't you make this case for the first 22 years as president that Ukraine wasn't a real country? You've got to give credit to Tucker Carlson. 
he's trying to move the conversation on. But I think, um, again, if, if you were Putin and you had this completely one-off, rare opportunity to really clarify your thought processes and where how you have come to the conclusions you have come to, you're not going to want a shortcut yourself. You know, he has decided, right, the first thing I want to do is give a complete history so that there's historical recognition for all of my decision-making thus far. When he's finished doing his little history lesson, then I'll be very interested to hear what his answer to Tucker Carlson's question, which is, why are you doing it now and not 20 years ago? Um, is it because um, Biden is running America and he's obviously not really quite, quite with it? Is that the reason? I'm very curious to see what he says. Very curious indeed. Uh, the Soviet Union was given a great deal of territory that had never belonged to it, including the Black Sea region. At some point, when Russia received them as an outcome of the Russo-Turkish Wars, they were called New Russia or Novorossiya. But that does not matter. What matters is that Lenin, the founder of the Soviet state, established Ukraine that way. For decades, the Ukrainian Soviet Republic developed as part of the USSR. And for unknown reasons, again, the Bolsheviks were engaged in Ukrainianization. It was not merely because the Soviet leadership was composed to a great extent of those originating from Ukraine. Rather, it was explained by the general policy of indigenous pursued by the Soviet Union. Same things were done in other Soviet republics. This involved promoting national languages and national cultures, which is not a bad in principle. That is how the Soviet Ukraine was created. After the World War II, Ukraine received, in addition to the lands that had belonged to Poland before the war, part of the lands that had previously belonged to Hungary and Romania. So Romania and Hungary had some of their lands taken away and given to the Soviet Ukraine, and they still remain part of Ukraine. So in this sense, we have every reason to affirm that Ukraine is an artificial state that was shaped at Stalin's will. Do you believe Hungary has a right to take its land back from Ukraine and that other nations have a right to go back to their 1654 <laughs> borders? Wow, that, that's an excellent question. Again, Nagamun Chatty would not have been paying enough attention to what her interviewee um, was saying to be able to call, just off the cuff come up with such an excellently phrased question. Um, Tucker Carlson has used dates, uh, countries, and a relative question relating specifically to the point in time where Putin's uh, current discussion is. That is excellent. I mean, he's really, really paying attention. I, I'm blown away by that question alone. Um, and it, it really does open up some questions because effectively what was starting to form in my mind is that, you know, Ukraine were being uh, harshly treated by Poland. They requested, you know, to be treated fairly. That was denied. So then they said to Russia, can you take us under your wing and stop Poland from bullying us, so on, so to speak? And Russia said yes, and then a war ensued for 13, a 13-year 13 war. And at the end of the war, okay, these are our boundaries, so on and so forth. And through World War One, through World War Two, and the aftermath of World War Two and the USSR, all of this, what had previously been, you know, probably quite relatively stable, started to untwine and started to segregate. But Tucker Carlson asks an excellent question. Are there parts of Ukraine which Hungary has the right to take back, based on the same logic that, um, that Putin is using here? And equally, do the people of Ukraine have the right to go back to pre-1700s um, status, if they so wish? Um, you know, basically, can Ukraine be a Ukraine again? You know, even... You know, how are people born? Let's let's be honest. There were no Russians until somebody decided that Russia 
was what they would call their country and everyone who lived in it would be Russian. Do you know what I mean? So it's a really excellent question. And I'm, I'm, I'm totally, I'm stoked now to hear what he's going to say. I hope he answers it. I really do. I'm not sure whether they should go back to the 1654 borders. But given Stalin's time, so-called Stalin's regime, which, as many claim, saw numerous violations of human rights and violations of the rights of other states, one may I must say, I think he appreciated that question. It's like one intellectual speaking to another intellectual and gets a very sensible intellectual question um, based on what they're talking about. That, uh, when two intellectuals are talking and you have a conversation, I tell you what, I haven't had a conversation like that since I was at college, I'll be honest. Um, and it, it, it's something about it. It's electrifying. It really sparks you really feel like you're having a proper conversation. If you've never experienced that, then I do feel for you. But those of you out there who have sat and had a deep and meaningful conversation on an inter with another intellectual, you, you hopefully have bounced into this, this state where the conversation leads itself and you're just basically, you're going with it. You know, the conversation, whatever you thought you were going to talk about originally, that's gone. You're now in this conversation and off you go. And I, I genuinely feel like that's where this conversation has just gone. This interview has just they, gone. That they could claim back those lands of theirs while having no right to do that. It is at least understandable. Have you told Viktor Orban that he can have part of Ukraine? Never. I have never told him. Not a single time. <coughs> we have not even had any conversation on that, but I actually know for sure that Hungarians who live there wanted to get back to their historical land. Moreover, I would like to share a very interesting story with you. <laughs> I'm not sure. But I think he just gave a politician's answer. It's difficult because I don't know enough about, you know, Russia and the history of Russia to really sort of necessarily argue against anything he says. But um, whatever it was, I don't feel like he fully, I don't feel like he fully took that question on as it was intended. Maybe there's a language barrier there. Um, but also, um, he has now changed the subject, which is a very politician thing to do. So I, I find this highly enlightening, I, I, genuinely. I digress. It's a personal one. Somewhere in the early 80s, I went on a road trip in a car from then Leningrad across the Soviet Union through Kiev. Made a stop in Kiev and then went to western Ukraine. I went to the town of Beregovoye, and all the names of towns and villages there were in Russian and in a language I did not understand, in Hungarian, in Russian and in Hungarian, not in Ukrainian, in Russian and in Hungarian. I was driving through some kind of village and there were men sitting next to the houses and they were wearing black three-piece suits and black cylinder hats. I asked, are they some kind of entertainers? I was told, no, they were not entertainers, they are Hungarians. I said, what are they doing here? What do you mean? This is their land, they live here. This was during the Soviet time in the 1980s. They preserved the Hungarian language, Hungarian names and all their national costumes. They are Hungarians and they feel themselves to be Hungarians. And of course, when now there is an infringement. Well, that, that is, and there's a lot of that though, I think many nations. Okay, this is the first time he, he, uh, Tucker Carlson has spoken over him. Uh, maybe he, uh, as he said at the very beginning, maybe he's starting to think this is filibustering. Um, you know, he's not answering a question directly, um, and he's he's changed the subject and gone off on a tangent. 
it's a good way to lose somebody's focus by constantly bouncing around from A to B to C. But A, you know, I do understand where Putin's coming from, right? So he's saying that he went into Western Ukraine and he saw Russian and Hungarian named um, buildings and cities and signs and whatnot. And the people that he met were Hungarian uh, in all for all intents and purposes. They were dressed like Hungarians, they spoke Hungarian, they wrote in Hungarian, they felt Hungarian, not Ukrainian. And I think that's what he's trying to establish, is that Ukraine, um, effectively what he's saying is, Ukraine are not a country. I think that's basically what it boils down to. Russians are Russians, Hungarians are Hungarians, Poland, Poland, and Lithuanians are Polish and Lithuanian. Ukrainians are like none of the above, but not their own thing either. Um, it's like it's like a soup of all the surrounding countries merging together and becoming. I don't, I don't know what you would call that. So that, I get his point, or, or I get the point he's trying to make. Whether or not I agree with that point is. Relevant, I think, at this point. Um, but yeah, Tucker Carlson now appears to be like, I need to take control in this interview. I think that's what he's trying to do, which is quite brave of him. I tell you what, he doesn't seem to be as nervous as I thought he would be. He's smiling quite a lot, he's chuckling away, he seems to be being himself. I'm surprised and so far impressed. Um, let's see what happens from this point. They're on. upset about Transylvania as well, as you obviously know. But many nations feel frustrated by the redrawn borders of the wars of the 20th yes. century and wars going back a thousand years, the ones that you mentioned. But the fact is that you didn't make this case in public until two years ago, February. And in the case that you made, which I read today, Just you, you explain at great length that you felt a physical threat from the West in NATO, including potentially a nuclear threat. And that's what got you okay. to move. Is that a fair characterization of what you said? Now, this is brilliant. Tucker Carlson has brought him back to his original um, line of questioning, whereas this is the statement you made on this date when you declared um, your interests in Ukraine. So kudos to Tucker Carlson. Took a lot longer to get there, but kudos. I understand that my long speeches probably fall outside of the genre of the interview. That is why I asked you at the beginning, are we going to have a serious talk or a show? <laughs> you said a serious talk. Okay. Respect to Putin on this point, you know, if you're going to have a serious talk, then um, you know. Coming back to what I said earlier, he wants to fully express his reasoning and his basis behind it. He doesn't want a shortcut. That he wants to explain the whole reasoning, which, if you're being totally honest, is what Tucker Carlson asked him to do, right? Why did you invade Ukraine? And he's saying, well, I'm, I'm telling you, you know, do you want this to be a television interview or do you want to have a serious conversation? If we're going to have a serious conversation, then I need to be able to tell you, you know, really answer your question and not shortcut it to suit the short attention span of today's Western civilization. So kudos to Putin there. I think Tucker Carlson maybe at this point realized that this wasn't filibustering and that Putin was genuinely trying to answer this question. Um, this is a really, really interesting interview thus far, far more interesting than I expected it to be. So bear with me, please. We are coming to the point where the Soviet Ukraine was established. Then, in 1991, the Soviet Union collapsed. And everything that Russia had generously bestowed on Ukraine was dragged away by the latter. I'm coming to a very important point of today's agenda. Thank you. After all, the collapse of the Soviet Union was effectively initiated by the Russian leadership. 
I do not understand what the Russian leadership was guided by at the time, but I suspect there were several reasons to think everything would be fine. First, I think that then Russian leadership believed that the fundamentals of the relationship between Russia and Ukraine were, in fact, a common language, more than 90% of the population there spoke Russian. Family ties, every third person there had some kind of family or friendship ties. Common culture, common history. Finally, common faith, coexistence with a single state for centuries, and deeply interconnected economies. All of these were so fundamental. All I'll tell you what pops into my head there. It, that almost sounds like how some people would describe Britain leaving the EU. They used to be, you know, part of us. We used to have a common... I mean, <laughs> okay, there are uh, caveats to that because we, we, we have a different monetary system. But you know, do you understand what I mean? But they used to be part of us and now they're outside of us. Uh, can we trust them? You know, are they now friends or enemies? I, I guess that's where he's guessing at. I assume. These elements together make our good yeah. relationships inevitable. The second point is a very important one. I want you, as an American citizen, and your viewers to hear about this as well. The former Russian leadership assumed that the Soviet Union had ceased to exist, and therefore there were no longer any ideological dividing lines. Russia even agreed voluntarily and proactively to the collapse of the Soviet Union and believed that this would be understood by the so-called civilized West as an invitation for cooperation and associateship. Okay, that seems quite actually factually accurate and realistic. Um, and although my historical recollection is a little bit shaky, um, I think it was actually received that way. Um, but uh, maybe that in itself caused additional problems. I think I see where he's going with this. That is what Russia was expecting, both from the United States and the so-called collective West as a whole. There were smart people, including in Germany, Egon Barr, a major politician of the Social Democratic Party, who insisted in his personal conversations with the Soviet leadership on the brink of the collapse of the Soviet Union, that a new security system should be established in Europe. Help should be given to unify Germany, but a new system should be also established to include the United States, Canada, Russia and other Central European countries. Yes. But NATO needs not to expand. That's what so, yeah, we, we, we've gone, we've basically gone full circle back to what I said right at the beginning. This is the, this is the Western argument. In essence, this is everything that the Western uh, news outlets have told us uh, is about the encroachment of NATO. That's like a very, very cut down short version of the historical reasoning behind his actions. So he's basically filled in all the depth that the thousand years prior to that, which is, I guess, his argument. They said, if NATO expands, everything would be just the same as during the Cold War, only closer to Russia's borders. That's all. He was a wise old man, but no one listened to him. In fact, he got angry once. If, he said, you don't listen to me, I'm never setting my foot in Moscow once again. Everything happened just as he had said. Yeah, well, it, of course, it did come true. And, I, and you've mentioned this many times. I think it's a fair point. And many in America thought yeah. that relations between <clears throat> Russia and the United States would be fine with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War, that the opposite happened. But you've never explained why 
you think that happened, except to say that the West fears a strong Russia, but we have a strong China the West does not seem very afraid of. Uh, what about Russia do you think convinced policymakers they had to take it down? Okay. The West is afraid of strong China more than it fears a strong Russia. Because Russia has 150 million people and China has 1.5 billion population and its economy is growing by leaps and bounds. Or <laughs> Very accurate correct statement there just to take 1.5 billion people and it, yeah wow wow just just try and put that into perspective india china russia collaborating against the rest of the world western civilization so to speak just just Theorize that, if you will. 5% a year, it used to be even more. But that's enough for China. As Bismarck once put it, potentials are the most important. China's potential is enormous. It is the biggest economy in the world today in terms of purchasing power parity and the size of the economy. It has already overtaken the United States quite a long time ago, and it is growing at a rapid clip. Let's not talk about who is afraid of whom, let's not reason in such terms. And let's get into the fact that after 1991, when Russia expected that it would be welcomed into the brotherly family of civilized nations, nothing like this happened. You tricked us. I don't mean you personally when I say you. Of course, I'm talking about the United States. The promise was that NATO would not expand eastward. But it happened five times. There were five waves of expansion. We tolerated all that. We were trying to persuade them. We were saying, please don't. We are as bourgeois now as you are. We are a market economy and there is no communist party power. Let's negotiate. Moreover, I have also said this publicly before. There was a moment when a certain rift started growing between us. Before that, Yeltsin came to the United States. Remember, he spoke in Congress and said the good words. God bless America. Everything he said were signals. Let us in. Remember the developments in Yugoslavia before the Yeltsin was lavished with praise? As soon as the developments in Yugoslavia started, he raised his voice in support of Serbs, and we couldn't but raise our voices for Serbs in their defense. I understand that there were complex processes on the way there, I do. But Russia could not help raising its voice in support of Serbs, because Serbs are also a special and close to us nation, with orthodox culture and so on. It's a nation that has suffered so much for generations. Well, regardless, what is important is that Yeltsin expressed his support. What did the United States do? In violation of international law and the UN Charter, it started bombing Belgrade. It was the United States that led the genie out of the bottle. Moreover, when Russia protested and expressed its resentment, what was said? The UN Charter and international law have become obsolete. Now everyone invokes international law, but at that time they started saying that everything was outdated, everything had to be changed. Indeed, some things need to be changed, as the balance of power has changed, it's true. But not in this manner. Yeltsin was immediately dragged through the mud, accused of alcoholism, of understanding nothing, of knowing nothing. He understood everything, I assure you. Well, I became president in 2000, I thought, Okay, so he puts forward there a very astute and you have to put yourself in his shoes, or not his shoes, but in Russia's shoes, and say, you know, the Russia, the USSR was um, collapsed and they made numerous attempts. Um, I mean, you know, they're not going to become a Western uh, civilization overnight. In fact, they may never become a Western civilization, and nor perhaps arguably should they have to. But they made an effort, let's say, an olive branch to try and become part of the collective Western civilizations, NATO organization, and, you know, work in harmony, as he says, well, as bourgeois as you. So, 
I can understand how that would have upset Russians. Um, and NATO expanding after promising they wouldn't expand. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of red lines there, aren't there? Uh, I think, uh, who was it who said it? Uh, I think Nigel Farage maybe said, it's it's uh, akin to poking the bear with a stick, the Russian bear. You're like, yeah, yeah, we won't encroach east in, in the easterly direction. But then you're poking the bear with the stick. But then, you know, the, the, the counter argument to that, of course, is that, you know, these individual countries should be able to choose who they align with. And if they wish to align with NATO, that's up to them. So arguably, was it NATO expanding or countries closer um, to Russia deciding to join NATO instead of align with Russia? Um, and I think that that is the crux of it there, is how do you see that progression? Was it NATO um, going against what they promised, or was it individual countries making individual decisions without NATO actively saying, come over, come over here and join us? Perhaps, I, I don't know what the truth is, of course. Um, I suspect it's a little of both. But... Um, you can see the argument. There is an argument to be had there, and I think it's only a fool would deny that that is an argument. Um, again, whether or not that justifies the invasion of Ukraine is neither here nor there. But the fact that that happened uh, is undeniable. The promise was made, the promise was overwritten, but how was it overwritten? Was it NATO overstepping the mark, or was it countries doing what they want with their own country? It's it, very important definition, but very difficult to prove. Okay, the Yugoslav issue is over, but we should try to restore relations. Let's reopen the door that Russia had tried to go through. And moreover, I said it publicly, I can reiterate. At a meeting here in the Kremlin with the outgoing President Bill Clinton, right here in the next room, I said to him, I asked him, Bill, do you think if Russia asked to join NATO, do you think it would happen? Suddenly he said, you know, it's interesting. I think so. But in the evening, when we met for dinner, he said, you know, I've talked to my team. No, no, it's not possible now. You can ask him. I think he will watch our interview. He'll confirm it. I wouldn't have said anything like that if it hadn't happened. Okay, Were you well, sincere? it's impossible now. Would you have joined NATO? Look, I asked the question, is it possible or not? And the answer I got was no. If I was insincere in my desire to find out what the leadership position was... But if he had said yes, would you have joined NATO? If he had said yes, the process of rapprochement would have commenced, and eventually it might have happened, if we had seen some sincere wish on the other side of our partners. But it didn't happen. Well, no means no. Okay, fine. Why do you think that is? Just to get to motive, I know you're clearly bitter about it. Um... I think, without context, it's a very difficult thing to react to, but... I totally get where he's coming from. He asked the question, and the answer was no. And by all counts, it sounded like a very firm no. Um, and that had changed in a matter of hours from, oh, maybe, maybe. Um, it would be great to have this conversation later on. And after speaking to his entourage, the decision was made no. In which case, you know, that's... That's problematic. <laughs> uh, that really is problematic. I understand. But why do you think the West rebuffed you then? Why the hostility? Why did the end of the Cold War not fix the relationship? I mean, what motivates this from your point of view? You said I was bitter about the answer. No, it's not bitterness. It's just a statement of fact. I'd agree with that. I don't think he is bitter. I don't think he came across as bitter. He asked a question. He got an answer. 
and he moved on. We're not bride and groom, bitterness, resentment. It's not about those kind of matters in such circumstances. We just realized we weren't welcome there, that's all. And I think that is very accurate. That's that, not bitter, but if you imagine, if you will, going back into America back in you know, the days where blacks and whites were not allowed to join together in matrimony, or we're not, you know, black people were not allowed to sit in the same rooms as white people. It's a little bit like that, isn't it? It is a little bit like that. Okay, fine. But let's build relations in another manner. Let's work for common ground elsewhere. Let's not forget that Russia provides much of the fuel to Europe right now. Much of the fuel to Europe comes from Russia, or it did before all this kicked off. You know, that is a way of working together, right? Um, it's not like Putin said, well, no, you're, you're the Western civilization. You can't have any of our fuel. And he'd be well within his rights to say that, but he didn't. So there's, it's got to be give and take on both sides. And, you know, I don't really know much about Russia, but this gentleman here is very smart, very factually aware and very coherent. And he's making a bloody good argument um, for having been treated quite poorly. And um, I'm not saying that justifies the invasion of Ukraine. Absolutely not. But he is making a lot of sense right now. There's no denying that. Why we received such a negative response, you should ask your leaders. I can only guess why. Too big a country with its own opinion and so on. Yeah, too big a country with its own opinion. Again, I reflect back to the EU and Britain. You know, uh, Britain had a veto, which sometimes we used. Um, but if we ever, if we as a country ever said, you know, we are not happy with the way this is going, we want to make a change, inevitably we would just ignore it. What, what institutions like the EU want is what they want. It's not what everybody wants. And this is the problem. This is my problem with the EU. You cannot keep everybody happy. Within the EU, you've got landlocked islands. You've got, you know, islands such as ours and Ireland themselves. You cannot put a single rule down that everybody is going to appreciate. Somebody always loses out. And that's why individual countries, in my humble opinion, working together works so much better than having an EU where there's one directive and everyone must follow it, even if it doesn't suit that country and their, you know, current geographical situation. This is, I think he's absolutely right. I am, I am seeing a lot of similarities here, which is interesting because I absolutely did not think that would be the case. And I'll tell you what, he could be a cold, ruthless, killer, murderer type person. And there's a lot of evidence to suggest that he is. But I'll tell you what, he's not stupid, is he? And the United States, I've seen how issues are being resolved in NATO. I will give you another example now concerning Ukraine. The US leadership exerts pressure and all NATO members obediently vote, even if they do not like something. Now I'll tell you what happened in this regard with Ukraine in 2000. Again, that's a very EU type thing. Uh, in the EU, a classic example, the EU um, and the Irish vote um, I think it was to take on the euro or whatever, and Ireland voted no, we don't want to do it. So the EU made them take it again, and they would have made them take it again until they agreed to do it. That is what I dislike about the EU. They asked a question, they had a vote, the vote didn't go the way they wanted, so they made them do it again. I think that's absolutely abhorrent, I think it's disgraceful, and I, again, I see similarities between the US dictating to NATO, um, yeah, it's quite enlightening this, this interview, it really is. 2008, although it's being discussed, 
I'm not going to open a secret to you, say anything new. Nevertheless, after that we tried to build relations in different ways. For example, the events in the Middle East, in Iraq. We were building relations with the United States in a very soft, prudent, cautious manner. I repeatedly raised the issue that the United States should not support separatism or terrorism in the North Caucasus. But they continue to do it anyway. And political support, information support, financial support, even military support came from the United States and its satellites for terrorist groups in the Caucasus. I once raised this issue with my colleague, also the President of the United States. He says, it's impossible, do you have proof? I said, yes. I was prepared for this conversation and I gave him that proof. He looked at it and you know what he said? I apologize, but that's what happened. I'll quote. He says, well, I'm gonna kick their ass. We waited and waited for some response. There was no reply. I said to the FSB director, write to the CIA, what is the result of the conversation with president? He wrote once, twice, and then we got a reply. We have the answer in the archive. The CIA replied, we have been working with the opposition in Russia, we believe that this is the right thing to do, and we will keep on doing it. That, now think what you will, but um, um, I, I worry for America, I really do. It seems to me that the president of America is not really the man in charge and hasn't been for probably 50, 60 years, maybe even longer than that. It feels to me like other people are pulling the strings and those strings are attached to the hands and the lips of the president of America. Um, and this is, I suspect, why Donald Trump is so avidly hated, because I don't think it's quite so easy to control Donald Trump as it has been, you know, President Biden. I think you could, could probably control that man with a little child and a chocolate bar. I don't really think um, America is as democratic as it likes to think it is. Uh, you know, I've, I've suspected this for a long time, and it's interesting that he said this. I really, really wish they had videoed that conversation and they were able to share it with Tucker Carlson right now. Clearly that's not going to happen. Massive shame, because something like that um, would be hugely telling. But, um, yeah. Very interesting. Just ridiculous. Well, okay. We realized that it was out of the question. Forces in opposition to you. So you're saying the CIA is trying to overthrow your government. Of course, they meant in that particular case the separatists, the terrorists who fought with us in the Caucasus. That's who they called the opposition. This is the second point. The third moment is a very important one, is the moment when the US missile defense system was created. The beginning. We persuaded... Okay, so I don't really know enough about the, the caucuses. I have heard of it. Um, it didn't really interest me very much, so I know nothing about it. So if you've got any relative information on that, I'd love to hear about it because, um, uh, yeah, obviously my knowledge of Russia over the years is, is, is actually pretty much squat. Um, I'm learning a lot more today than I have done in the last 30 years. It's for a long time not to do it in the United States. Moreover, after was invited by Bush Jr.'s father, Bush Sr., to visit his place on the ocean, I had a very serious conversation with President Bush and his team. 
I propose that the United States, Russia and Europe jointly create a missile defense system that we believe, if created unilaterally, threatens our security, despite the fact that the United States officially said that it was being created against missile threats from Iran. That was the justification for the deployment of the missile defense system. I suggested working together, Russia, the United States and Europe. They said it was very interesting. They asked me, are you serious? I said, absolutely. May I ask, what year was this? I don't remember. It is easy to find out on the Internet when I was in the USA at the invitation of a Bush senior. It is even easier to learn from someone I'm going to tell you about. I was told it was... That's the first time, <clears throat> excuse me, that a date has escaped his mind, I would say. But yeah, surely that's documented somewhere. It's very interesting. I said, just imagine if we could tackle such a global strategic security challenge together. The world will change. We'll probably have disputes, probably economic and even political ones, but we could drastically change the situation in the world. He says yes, and asks, are you serious? I said, of course. We need to think about it, I'm told. I said, go ahead, please. Then Secretary of Defense Gates, former director of CIA and Secretary of State Rice came in here, in this cabinet, right here at this table. They sat on this table. Me, the foreign minister, the Russian defense minister on that side, they said to me, yes, we have thought about it, we agree. I said, thank God, great no but with some exceptions so twice you've described u.s presidents making decisions and then being undercut yeah i'm glad Tucker carlson has picked up on that because th that is very evident to me i've seen that happen way before now i haven't learned that today it's nothing new but yeah i mean that is absolutely the situation and in contrast you know in russia a totally different argument, a whole, whole different conversation to be had over there. You know, if Putin decides something, that's kind of what happens. Um, so, yeah, which is better? Uh, you know, do you want a leader to lead or do you want a leader to be the puppet of the people hidden behind the leader who are actually pulling all the strings? I know which one I By their agency heads. So it sounds like you're describing a system that's not run by the people who are elected, in your telling. That's right, that's right. In the end, they just told us to get lost. I'm not going to tell you the details, because I think it's incorrect. After all, it was confidential conversation. But our proposal was declined, that's a fact. It was right then when I said, Look, but then we will be forced to take countermeasures. We will create such strike systems that will certainly overcome missile defense systems. The answer was, we are not doing this against you and you do what you want, assuming that it is not against us, not against the United States. I said, okay. Very well. That's the way it went. And we created hypersonic systems with intercontinental range, and we continue to develop them. We are now ahead of everyone, the United States and the other countries, in terms of the development of hypersonic strike systems, and we are improving them every day. Okay, so... <laughs> this just uh, initiated a, a sort of... Um, a Western civilization understanding of Russians. A, they steal your technology. B, their technology is put together with blue tack and sellotape. C, they talk a very good game. I don't know if I'm right. I don't know if I'm wrong. And maybe that's part of the game. Part of the game is keep you guessing, like Hitler did um, in Germany. Um, before World War II, where they weren't supposed to have a navy and they weren't supposed to have an army and they weren't supposed to have an air force. And yet, despite many, many rumors, they had, well, initially they didn't have any, but they made it look like they did. And nobody reacted. 
It's like they poked the bear, the bear didn't react, so then they started making... You see what I mean? It's, it's kind of a political game. Um, so maybe there's a part of that going on, but yeah, I, I couldn't help but knee-jerkily react and sort of feel like, well, you know, we know what Russians are like. They steal technology. They put it together with blue tack and sellotape. And... But then, you know, the International Space Station, that's, that's a collaborative effort. And, okay, not perfect, but um, impressive nonetheless, right? But it wasn't us. We proposed to go the other way. And we were pushed back. Now, about NATO's expansion to the east. Well, we were promised no NATO to the east, not an inch to the east, as we were told. And then what? They said, well, it's not enshrined on paper, so we'll expand. So there were five waves of expansion. The Baltic states, the whole of Eastern Europe, and so on. And now I come to the main thing. They have come to the Ukraine, ultimately. In 2008, at the summit in Bucharest, they declared that the doors for Ukraine and Georgia to join NATO were open. Right, so this is... This is okay, I mean, that's at least that's a logical time progression. Um, it came into power, and then in 2008, I mean, still a huge time delay, but in 2008, the doors were open for Ukraine to join NATO. Um, I can understand why that might make them feel fidgety. Um, but then, you know, <clears throat> it, it, it's got to come back to what is it they're scared of about NATO? Or what is it that NATO is scared of about Russia? I'm not sure I particularly know the answer to that either way. Now about how decisions are made there. Germany, France seem to be against it, as well as some other European countries. But then, as it turned out, later President Bush, and he's such a tough guy, a tough politician, as I was told later, he exerted pressure on us and we had to agree. And it's ridiculous, it's like kindergarten. Where are the guarantees? What kindergarten is this? What kind of people are these? Who are they? You see, they were pressed, they agree. And then they say, Ukraine won't be in the NATO, you know? I say, I don't know. I know you agreed in 2008. Why won't you agree in the future? Well, they pressed us then. I say, why won't they press you tomorrow? And you'll agree again. Well, it's nonsensical. Who's there to talk to? I just don't understand. We're ready to talk, but with whom? Again, you know, coming back to the problem with the EU is where these countries are not sovereign, they are being manipulated and handled by unknown exterior forces. Now, you might say, you know, well, the, the president of America spoke to them and he changed their mind. Well, no, we've already ascertained that the president of America was being controlled by people behind the president, people you don't know, didn't elect, um, and you don't know what, what it is they do or don't want from the world. Uh, it's looking very sinister. And it, if anything, it's not painting a very good picture of the US at the moment, I have to say, or the EU for that matter. That's not to say I'm suddenly a, a fan of Russia or a fan of Putin or anything like that, but it's it's stuff that we all know, I think, if we deep down think about it, that these are things that we've known for a long time, but hearing it coming from the Russian president, this this interview could really unlock. This could either escalate things exponentially or it could totally transform the world in a positive way. I really think genuinely if people sit down and watch it and really take in what's being said and sometimes what isn't being said, there's a lot to be learned. Where are the guarantees? None. So they started to develop the territory of Ukraine. Whatever is there, I have told you the background, how this territory developed, what kind of relations there were with Russia. Every second or third person there has always had some ties with Russia. And during the elections in already independent, sovereign Ukraine, which gained its independence as a result of the Declaration of Independence, and by the way, 
It says that Ukraine is a neutral state and in 2008 suddenly the doors or gates to NATO were open to it. Oh, come on. This is not how we agreed. Now all the presidents that have come to power in Ukraine, they relied on electorate with a good attitude to Russia in one way or the other. This is the southeast of Ukraine. This is a large number of people. And it was very difficult to dissuade this electorate, which had a positive attitude towards Russia. Viktor Yanukovych came to power and how? The first time he won after President Kuchma, they organized a third round, which is not provided for in the constitution of Ukraine. This is a coup d'etat. Just imagine, someone in the United States wouldn't like the outcome. In 2014? Before that. No, this was before that. After President Kuchma, Viktor Yanukovych won the elections. However, his opponents did not recognize that victory. The US supported the opposition and the third round was scheduled. What is this? This is a coup. The US supported it and the winner of the third round came to power. This is, uh, I, I mean, I don't know how accurate this is. I'd have to look it up. But if take him on his word, it is accurate, then it, my God, doesn't it just ring bells of the EU forcing people to take multiple votes until they vote the right way? Who do you think it has a, a, a horrible vibration? Imagine that. if in the US something was not to someone's liking and the third What's round the of election, which the US Constitution does not provide for, was organized. <laughs> Nonetheless, it was done in Ukraine. <laughs> okay, Victor. Yeah, let, let's just take that. Uh, on merit and say that um, imagine in America if um, there were two people that were up for election but the um, president who is currently in place um, made it impossible for the other person to be elected or even run to be president of America. Oh, hang on, isn't that exactly what they're trying to do right now? Um, it's scary what he's saying. Now, if you think back, it's a long way back, I grant you, to my very, very opening question. I want to know whether someone else can run Russia other than Putin. Um, I, he hasn't asked that question, but I think it's so relevant right now. He's talking, you know, imagine if they did this in, in, in America. But, you know, Putin's been in charge for 20 years odd years, 22 years, I forget now, um, with no signs of ever, ever possibly being replaced. I mean, how, how would it even happen? I would love that question to be answered right now. It's not going to be, but it's such a relevant question. It's like, well, yeah, you're pointing fingers at America right now, and quite rightly highlighting how wrong that would be, and yet what's going on in your country how is it you're still in charge after 20 years? Yushchenko, who was considered a pro-Western politician, came to power. Fine, we have built relations with him as well. He came to Moscow with visits. We visited Kiev. I visited too. We met in an informal setting. If he's pro-Western, so be it. It's fine, let people do their job. The situation should have developed inside the independent Ukraine itself. As a result of Kuchma's leadership, things got worse and Viktor Yanukovych came to power after all. Maybe he wasn't the best president and politician, I don't know. I don't want to give assessments. However, the issue of the association with the EU came up. We have always been lenient to this, suit yourself. But when we read through the Treaty of Association, it turned out to be a problem for us, since we had a free trade zone and open customs borders with Ukraine, which under this association had to open its borders for Europe, which could have led to flooding of our market. We said, no, this is not going to work. Okay, so imagine if the, the ball was on the other foot, if Ukraine had very close ties with Europe, you know what the EU are like about their free trade agreements. 
you know, Britain steps outside of the EU, all of a sudden, no, you can't be part of the group anymore. We can't trade with you anymore. Uh, you know, all of a sudden, the apples and carrots and stuff that we buy from each other, well, it all has to be checked. You know, we can't guarantee the safety of our people. What a load of BS. All they're trying to do is control the, the value, the price of the goods that they're selling, and drum them up and make it best for them. That's all they're interested in. The EU has no interest in, you know, helping the world or helping the world economy or the poor um, and starving people not to be poor. They have no interest in helping anybody like that. And I'm not for one second suggesting that Russia are. But if you flipped Ukraine over and said that it already had ties with Europe and it wanted to join Russia, imagine the backlash from Europe. The European Union would not allow that to happen. Absolutely no way, shape, or form. You're part of our group or you're part of their group. You can't be part of both. And if you choose to be with them, we're not going to play nicely with you anymore. But isn't that exactly what they're doing? Oh, so I can understand where he's coming from. From, you know, his job is to protect financial stability. Um, they've got free trade agreements with Ukraine, you know, the the impact of opening up doors to the EU means that the, the, they could flood the market, which is exactly what the EU are intentionally going to do. You know, they want to dominate and control. They don't want to work in harmony and make the world a better place. They want control. Um, so, yeah, I can totally understand why uh, Putin didn't exactly jump to joy. We shall close our borders with Ukraine then. The customs borders, that is. Yanukovych started to calculate how much Ukraine was going to gain, how much to lose, and said to his European partners, I need more time to think before signing. The moment he said that, the opposition began to take destructive steps, which were supported by the West. It all came down to Maidan and a coup in Ukraine. So he did more trade with Russia than with the EU. Ukraine did. No, of course. Of course. It's not even the matter of trade volume, although for the most part it is. It is the matter of cooperation ties, which the entire Ukrainian economy was based on. The cooperation ties between the enterprises were very close since the times of the Soviet Union. One enterprise there used to produce components to be assembled both in Russia and Ukraine and vice versa. They used to be very close ties. A coup d'etat was committed, although I shall not delve into details now, as I find doing it inappropriate, the US told us. Calm Yanukovych down and we will calm the opposition. Let the situation unfold in the scenario of a political settlement. We said all right, agreed, let's do it this way. As the Americans requested, Yanukovych did use neither the armed forces nor the police, Yet the armed opposition committed a coup in Kiev. What is that supposed to mean? Who do you think you are? I wanted to ask the then US leadership. With the backing of whom? With the backing of CIA, of course. The organization you wanted to join back in the day, as I understand. We should. Did Tucker Carlson want to join the CIA? I've not heard that before. That's interesting. Um, so what, he's, what he says there about the CIA backing those operatives is, I would say, speculative. Unless he has definitive evidence, which he hasn't produced, and he certainly hasn't said he's got any. Um, it's like he's just a knee-jerk reaction. It's like, well, you know, they've done it before. It, it has all the all the ringtones of, uh, of the CIA exactly the same as it was before. So maybe he's right, maybe he's wrong. Um, he has no proof to back that up, so you can't really take it into context. But um, I can see how he could easily, I mean, yeah, uh, you know, like, there, there is one overriding thing. I think I'm gonna have to break this up into two, two parts at least. Uh, there is, is one overriding thing, and that's that right at the beginning, Tucker Carlson said that, you know, Putin had said he was fearful of an invasion from America, so to speak. 
Now, we've never actually got to hear that quote out because Putin has sort of dominated the discussion, which is not necessarily a bad thing, because at the end of the day, we don't want to know about Tucker Carlson. We want to hear from Putin. So the more Putin speaks, the better, in my humble opinion. Um, <clears throat> whether or not um, he has actually answered that initial question or not, I th I'd, I'd say probably not. But he denied saying that he was worried about an attack coming from America. But Tucker Carlson was, quote unquote, using a quote uh, made by Putin. So. Um, has he contradicted himself there? I'm going to have to do some research. At least if I break this up into two parts, it gives me an opportunity to go and do some research on some of the stuff that's been said and educate myself a bit more. Because at the end of the day, context and knowledge, they're very important when you're trying to ascertain uh, right from wrong, pretty much like when the Brexit vote was, was going on. And um, I realized in that moment that my own government were threatening me and the pro-Brexit people were encouraging me. And I realized in that moment that anyone who's trying to threaten you or bully you into a decision is probably not the person that you should be following or trusting. And arguably, there seems to be a lot more bullying coming from the West than from Russia going the other way as of sort of you know the, the, the breakdown of USSR um, yeah it's it's enlightening this I, I, I don't know where I sit exactly yet is the war on Ukraine justified I guess that's the key question isn't it um, still not convinced uh, to be honest so I'm still on the no side but I am listening and I am learning and I am rethinking some things and I'm reevaluating certainly my opinion of Putin. I thought he was some sort of crazy man who was scared of COVID, but uh, he doesn't come across quite like that, does he? Yeah. It's an intriguing interview. I think it's a really good interview. Thank God they didn't let you in. Although it is a serious organization. I understand. My former vis-a-vis -vis in the sense that I served in the first main directorate, Soviet Union's intelligence service. They have always been our opponents. A job is a job. Technically, they did everything right. They achieved their goal of changing the government. However, from a political standpoint, it was a colossal mistake. Surely it was political leadership's miscalculation. They should have seen what it would evolve into. So, in 2008, the doors of NATO were opened for Ukraine. In 2014, there was a coup, they started persecuting those who did not accept the coup, and it was indeed a coup. They created the threat to Crimea, which we had to take under our protection. They launched the war in Donbas in 2014 with the use of aircraft and artillery against civilians. This is when it all started. There is a video of aircraft attacking Donetsk from above. They launched a large-scale military operation, then another one. When they failed, they started to prepare the next one. All this against the background of military development of this territory and opening of NATO's doors. How could we not express concern over what was happening? From our side, this would have been a culpable negligence. That's what it would have been. It's just that the US political leadership pushed us to the line we could not cross, because doing so could have ruined Russia itself. Besides, we could not leave our brothers in faith, in fact, a part of Russian people, in the face of this war machine. What was the, so but that was eight years before the current conflict started. So what was the trigger for you? What was the moment where you decided you had to do this? Initially, it was the coup in Ukraine that provoked the conflict. By the way, back then the representatives of three European countries, Germany, Poland and France, arrived. They were the guarantors of the signed agreement between the government of Yanukovych and the opposition. 
They signed it as guarantors. Despite that, the opposition committed a coup and all these countries pretended that they didn't remember that they were guarantors of the peaceful settlement. They just threw it in the stove right away, and nobody recalls that. I don't know if the U.S. know anything about the agreement between the opposition and the authorities and its three guarantors who, instead of bringing this whole situation back in the political field, supported the coup. Although it was meaningless, believe me, because President Yanukovych agreed to all conditions. He was ready to hold an early election, which he had no chance of winning, frankly speaking. Everyone knew that. Then why the coup? Why the victims? Why threatening Crimea? Why launching an operation in Donbas? This I do not understand. That is exactly what the miscalculation is. CIA did its job to complete the coup. I think one of the deputy secretaries of state said that it cost a large sum of money, almost five billion. But the political mistake was colossal. Why would they have to do that? All this could have been done legally, without victims, without military action without losing Crimea. We would have never considered to even lift a finger if it hadn't been for the bloody developments on Maidan. Because we agreed with the fact that after the collapse of the Soviet Union, our borders should be along the borders of former Union's republics. We agreed to that. But we never agreed to NATO's expansion and, moreover, we never agreed that Ukraine would be in NATO. We did not agree to NATO bases there without any discussion with us. For decades we kept asking, don't do this, don't do that. And what triggered the latest events? Firstly, the current Ukrainian leadership declared that it would not implement the Minsk agreements, which had been signed, as you know, after the events of 2014 in Minsk where the plan of peaceful settlement in Donbas was set forth. But no, the current Ukrainian leadership, foreign minister, all other officials and then president himself said that they don't like anything about the Minsk agreements. In other words, they were not going to implement it. A year or a year and a half ago, former leaders of Germany and France said openly to the whole world that they indeed signed the Minsk agreements, but they never intended to implement them. They simply led us by the nose. Was there anyone for you to talk to? Did you call a U.S. President, Secretary of State and say, if you keep militarizing Ukraine with NATO forces, this is going to get, this is going to be a, we're going to act. We talked about this all the time. We addressed the United States and European countries' leadership to stop these developments immediately, to implement the Minsk agreements. Frankly speaking, I didn't know how we were going to do this, but I was ready to implement them. These agreements were complicated for Ukraine. They included lots of elements of those Donbas territories' independence. That's true. However, I was absolutely confident, and I'm saying this to you now, I honestly believe that if we managed to convince the residents of Donbas, and we had to work hard to convince them to return to the Ukrainian statehood, then gradually the wounds would start to heal. When this part of territory reintegrated itself into common social environment, when the pensions and social benefits were paid again, all the pieces would gradually fall into place. No, nobody wanted that. Everybody wanted to resolve the issue by military force only. But we could not let that happen. And the situation got to the point when the Ukrainian side announced, no, we will not do anything. They also started preparing for military action. It was they who started the war in 2014. Our goal is to stop this war. And we did not start this war in 2022. This is an attempt to stop it. Do you think you've stopped it now? I mean, if you would... That's a huge statement. Um, 
So I've got so much research to do now. Um, this is an attempt from Russia to stop 2014 war. Quote from Putin. Interesting. Interesting. Achieved your aims? Uh, no, we haven't achieved our aims yet, because one of them is the Nazification. This means the prohibition of all kinds of neo-Nazi movements. This is one of the... Uh, neo-Nazi movements. I remember him bringing this up, or I remember this being mentioned before. Nazi movements in Ukraine. Uh, I remember him saying something about this before. I'm not sure there's any justification or validation to it, but okay. The problems that we discussed during the negotiation process, which ended in Istanbul early this year. And it was not our initiative, because we were told by the Europeans, in particular, that it was necessary to create conditions for the final signing of the documents. My counterparts in France and Germany said, how can you imagine them signing a treaty with a gun to their heads? The troops should be pulled back from Kiev. I said, all right, we withdrew the troops from Kiev. As soon as we pulled back our troops from Kiev, our Ukrainian negotiators immediately threw all our agreements reached in Istanbul into the bin and got prepared for a long-standing armed confrontation with the help of the United States and its satellites in Europe. That is how the situation has developed. And that is how it looks now. But, but what do, is part of my ignorance? What is denazification? What would that mean? That is what I want to talk about right now. It is a very important issue. Denazification. Sorry, another real-world interruption. I'm going to have to cut this short soon. Uh, it's getting busy in the Vacation. house. After gaining independence, Ukraine began to search, as some Western analysts say, its identity. And it came up with nothing better than to build this identity upon some false heroes who collaborated with Hitler. I have already said that in the early 19th century, when the theorists of independence and sovereignty of Ukraine appeared, they assumed that an independent Ukraine should have very good relations with Russia. But due to the historical development, those territories were part of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Poland, where Ukrainians were persecuted and treated quite brutally as well as were subject to cruel behavior. There were also attempts to destroy their identity. All this remained in the memory of the people. When World War II broke out, part of this extremely nationalist elite collaborated with Hitler believing that he would bring them freedom. The German troops, even the SS troops, made Hitler's collaborators do the dirtiest work of exterminating the Polish and Jewish population. Hence this brutal massacre of the Polish and Jewish population, as well as the Russian population too. This was led by the persons who are well known, Bandera, Shukevich. It was those people who were made national heroes, that is the problem. And we are constantly told that nationalism and neo-Nazism exist in other countries as well. Yes, they are seedlings, but we approve them, and other countries fight against them. But Ukraine is not the case. These people have been made into national heroes in Ukraine. 
Monuments to those people have been erected. They are displayed on flags. Their names are shouted by crowds that walk with torches, as it was in Nazi Germany. These were people who exterminated Poles, Jews and Russians. It is necessary to stop this practice and prevent the dissemination of this concept. I say that Ukrainians are part of the one Russian people. They say, no, we are a separate people. Okay, fine. If they consider themselves a separate people, they have the right to do so, but not on the basis of Nazism, the Nazi ideology. Would you be satisfied with the territory that you have now? I will finish answering the question. You just asked a question about neo-Nazism and denazification. Look, the president of Ukraine visited Canada. This story is well known, but being silenced in the Western countries. The Canadian parliament introduced a man who, as the speaker of the parliament said, fought against the Russians during the World War II. Well, who fought against the Russians during the World War II? Hitler and his accomplices. It turned out that this man served in the SS troops. He personally killed Russians, Poles and Jews. The SS troops consisted of Ukrainian nationalists who did this dirty work. The president of Ukraine stood up with the entire parliament of Canada and applauded this man. How can this be imagined? The president of Ukraine himself, by the way, is a Jew by nationality. Really, my question is, what do you do about it? I mean, Hitler's been dead for 80 years. Nazi Germany no longer exists. And so, true. And so, I think what you're saying is you want to extinguish or at least control Ukrainian nationalism. But how? How do you do that? Послушайте меня. Ваш вопрос очень тонкий. Listen to me. Your question is very subtle, and I can tell you what I think. Do not take offense. Of course. This question appears to be subtle. It is quite pesky. You say Hitler has been dead for so many years, 80 years, but his example lives on. People who exterminated Jews, Russians and Poles are alive. And the president, the current president of today's Ukraine, applauds him in the Canadian parliament, gives a standing ovation. Can we say that we have completely uprooted this ideology if what we see is happening today? That is what denazification is in our understanding. We have to get rid of those people who maintain this concept and support this practice and try to preserve it. That is what denazification is. That is what we mean. Right. My question was a little more specific. It was, of course, not a defense of... Okay. I'm going to wrap it up there. I, I totally get where it's coming from. I wish Tucker Carlson would say, you know, a couple of days later, the Canadians identified that he was a Nazi, they apologized, and there was a, an internal something or other, an internal investigation or whatever. Um, but he didn't ask him that question because he's still trying to get an answer to his question. So Putin um, has answered his first question, why did you attack Ukraine? But by God, did it take a long time to get to that answer. Um, there's an hour left in this interview. I'm going to break it up into at least two parts, maybe multiple parts, but um, yeah, it's it's really interesting. And it, you know, up until about three days ago, who'd have even thought it possible to be able to hold an interview with Putin? So I mean, this is just incredible. It's it's like history, um, history being made right in front of my eyes. It's it's incredible, and it's it's good. I think to hear from a Russian perspective. I think. Um, and by no means am I a Putin fan, nor do I think he's, you know, all um, sprinkles and delights. But, um, you know, it's, I think it's very important to hear both sides of the argument. 
and relevant questions to be raised based on that. For example, the Canadian Nazi and um, you know promises given by America that were then over American presidents, which were then overturned by his entourage. These are questions that need to be answered, and hopefully Tucker Carlson is the man to uh, initiate the conversations that get us the answers we need. Thank you for watching. Please do let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. Um, I don't by any means proclaim to know everything, but um, I try and stay open-minded.